Okay, let's now continue on uh, this part, which uh, is about uh, lingo and uh, formulating uh, linear programming problems um, and solving them to optimality. And as we have seen, we can solve or formulate this uh, lot sizing problem by the objective function minimizing the number of uh, setups in the whole uh, time horizon uh, and adding the holding cost multiplied by, by the holding cost and the number of items stored from one period to the next one. First group here will, uh, uh, will then be the balancing of production and inventory uh, according to the given demand in each of the periods. Uh, the second group is uh, to uh, ensure that we are only producing in the periods where the delta is equal to 1, which means that you have a setup, and also not producing more than the maximum amount, which is here given as the sum of the, uh, uh, of the demand for all the 10 periods. And the last group here will tell that the deltas are binary, which means that they either have the value 0 or the value 1. Uh, we can formulate this LP problem uh, mathematically like uh, this. This is a minimization problem. So we want to minimize the C, which is defined to be the sum. from 1 and up to n, the number of periods. Uh, and then the sum of the setup cost k multiplied by the delta for, uh, use the time t here, for that particular time period, plus the holding cost multiplied by the level of the stock or the inventory level for period T. And we can also add the cost of production multiplied by the production level in period T. This in our example is a constant, the, so it's not considered as uh, um, as a part of the function, but it should also, uh, in a general formulation, be included, because this will be the production cost. And then, theoretically, you can have different, uh, different, uh, uh, or, or you can have production cost, which is uh, different from for different uh, periods. So, I theoretically, you could also have a T there. But in our case, we don't look at this part, so we just stop here and reduce this one. But in the general formulation, this should also be, uh, be included. Uh, and then we have the inventory balance uh, constraints, which is uh, xt plus the i inventory level in period t minus 1 plus, no, minus the inventory level in period t should then meet the demand for period t. This is the second uh, or the constraint uh, set which is uh, given here in the mathematical with a mathematical general uh, formulation shown here. Uh, and we can also add the next group which is that the production should be equal to the constant which in this case is uh, the sum for all the demand for all the uh, periods multiplied by the delta for period t, which is defined to be binary, which also mathematically can be given here, that the delta is an element in the set 0 and 1. So this is the mathematical formulation of this lot sizing problem which here is defined to be uh, <coughs> well given 
uh, as the LP formulation for one particular uh, problem. But this is the, the general formulation. So, this is a very simple problem. Uh, 10 periods given demand. Uh, often these types of LP problem can be very large. There can be lots of variables. Here we have only 10 delta variables and 10 inventory variables. Um, LP problems can be huge. There can be thousands of variables. And there can be tens of thousands of constraints lines here. And then, of course, formulating such a problem might be, well, not necessarily complex, but at least time consuming. R um, Printing thousands of, of lines, make sure that all the uh, lines are uh, or the constraints are, are correct and so on, might be rather uh, time consuming. So, uh, Lingo and also other optimizers will also have some kind of programming language which can be used, which is not, uh, well, which is, is a part of the curriculum in this course, but you don't need to know very much details, but you should know about this. Uh, concept of programming and defining uh, variables as a computer program uh, or a computer-like program in this uh, type of, uh, uh, of optimization uh, software. So here we talk about an alternative mechanism for modeling instead of writing uh, thousands of lines of constraints and eventually also thousands of different variables. We can use a modeling language, uh, Lingo, the here, the, this uh, system, uh, the modeling language is also called Lingo. Uh, Ample is also very common, um, used uh, together with the software called, called Cplex. We have others, GAMS, we have also several other types of programming language which is, is used in software for optimization uh, problems. And here the point is to write the objective and constraints. Uh, it, it will become tedious when the models increase in size and maintenance of the model and data is complicated and risky. So then we rather can use a programming language or a modeling language. This makes it easier to maintain the model. It will also reduce the probability of modeling errors. It will separate the model and the data, which makes it also easier to do changes. And developing development time might be higher the first time you will create a model, but it, uh, uh, it will make uh, makes it much easier to maintain and, uh, and develop the model uh, further. Here, for those of you who have some experience in, in computer programming, this might be similar uh, or, or be, be familiar, uh, but uh, I will just shortly present these types of programming uh, uh, commands. We have the for command, which is a loop, which means that we are able to define that the same sentence will be repeated a, cer a certain number of times. Similar, we have the sum command, which tells that we will sum the same expression a certain number of times. We might define exceptions that this particular line or this particular command should not be included in a for and or a sum loop. You might define the variables and the constant by using the data command and you might also define the indexes by using the sets command. And I will also show this problem which uh, yeah, this is uh, early version from 2006 but I also have the similar version as a lingo file, which uh, we can rather look at because we can look at this one, lot size LG4. Here we will define the model first with the model command and also the green here with the, uh, these are comments which is not a part of the program. So this file will define the model 
which has a set from 1 to 10, which in this case means that you have 10 different periods, 10 weeks. And this TID variable will then have a value for each of these uh, 10 different cells in, in, uh, in this uh, so-called array. Uh, then we will define the fixed data. The R are defined as the demand here. The K is the setup cost. The H is the holding cost. And the C is the production cost. And again, we have variables defined here. The Xs, which is the size of the production, and the Is, which is the size of the inventory level. And the delta, which is the binary variable, which tells whether you will have a setup or not. Uh, here we are given the values of the data. This is the demand, as we remember, the demand line. The case are exactly the same, the same setup cost, independent of period. In theory, this can be different. This is the K here, and in theory, we can have different setup costs for different periods. Similar, the holding cost is also constant, 0 0.6, independent of period. And we have the C, which is the, the last part here, the production cost, which in our case is set to be 0. Or it could be set to be any other number, uh, but it is considered to be a constant. So it will be the same cost whether you are producing in period number 1 or in period number 2, 3, 4, or whatever. So this is the data section. And when we have put up this model, we can easily exchange the values here and use this model on any other similar <coughs> problem. The exact programming commands are given here. We want to minimize the t cost function, which is the c function here. The t cost function will consist of the sum for all the periods in defined in the TID array from 1 to 10. And we want to minimize the sum of k, the setup cost, multiplied by, data, by delta, uh, the binary variable, plus the holding cost multiplied by the inventory. Holding cost given here, inventory is then a variable shown here, and plus the c cost multiplied by the, X, uh, the level of production, which, again, is said to be constant since we have the C values defined as 0 here. And then here we are giving the constraints. First, the constraint set here. That first, X1, which is defined to be the R1, which is the demand, and the production minus the inventory level in period 1 should meet the demand. And then for the TID array from 1 up to 10, but not, this we remember, was the, uh, was, was the command for not including period number 1, because the period number 1 is defined as the in the first line here. For all the other indexes in this array, we should have the production plus the inventory level in the previous period minus the in inventory level in the current period should be equal to the demand. And this is exactly similar to what we have seen, but commanded uh, with each different line in the first, uh, first uh, lingo file for, for this problem. And again, this will be the next constraint set that the production should be less than or equal to the sum of r for all the t variables multiplied by the delta. And this command will tell the same as this constraint set, as we also have seen in the previous uh, file, uh, lingo file. And in addition, here inside the for loop, this is inside the same loop here, we will define the deltas to be binary, as we have done here. All the delta variables will be binary, have the value 0 and 1. And trying to solve this one, 
will give us exactly the same solution as we saw by uh, defining each variable independently and each constraint line uh, independently. Solution is the same, optimal value 610.2 and production shown here. Yeah, K values are constant to be 132, but the variables, as we remember, are the x's and the i's here, and this is the same solution as we just found by looking at the other lingo program. The one found in the lot size LG4. So this is the lot size 2 where you actually are using programming commands to model the same problem. But if we do this correctly, the solution will be exactly the same as we can see here. So, as mentioned, this is uh, the curriculum in this course is not to learn actually to how to use these types of program, but you should know about them and you should also be able to understand that this is a way to model the lot sizing problem we have uh, talked about here. So I will also upload the other file, the LG2 file, this file on, on Frontend just after this lecture. So then I think we are ready to start on the last topic, the last chapter in this course. And this is described in chapter number eight. And I will go through some theory very fast and then show some example, hopefully, to uh, on how we can find uh, methods where we will use this scheduling or techniques to use in operations uh, scheduling in, uh, in logistics. <coughs> uh, so here we have in operations we have different types of scheduling problems. One which we will focus on uh, in, in this course is the job shop scheduling. Find a way find a schedule to, uh, to uh, which sequence the jobs should be executed when you have one machine, for example. You have one machine or one workstation or one worker or, or eventually, and you have a certain number of jobs with different uh, time to, uh, for each job and also uh, some due time or due date when they should be finished. But we have lots of other scheduling problems which should be mentioned and should be known about. Personal scheduling is one type of a problem where you should find a schedule when should different people work, which needs to meet different constraints. That you have production, you should have enough people on each production unit to meet the production uh, demand and so on. Facility scheduling is also a scheduling problem. Uh, what they do on this college, the administration for example, uh, by me being in this room teaching this course to you is actually a facility scheduling problem. Then you have, well, the room is one facility, the teacher is one facility, the class is one facility, and you can't have two courses on the uh, same time. Uh, you can't have two courses for the same class at the same time and one teacher cannot teach uh, several places at the same time and so on. So we have lots of different constraints also to meet which should be met when you are putting up a, a facility uh, schedule. Vehicle scheduling and routing is a very huge research area. Uh, when you should deliver your products to different customers, uh, you have to fill up the vehicles, they have to visit customers and try to find a schedule and routing of the vehicles, which is uh, as uh, cheap as, uh, as possible. Project management, how to deal with different parts of a product, uh, of, of a project, to plan what should be performed at which, which time before other parts of the project, for example. And also we talk about dynamic versus static scheduling. Uh, static scheduling, when you know everything in advance, you know all the details, you can put up a, a detailed plan. And dynamic scheduling is when things is changing. If something is happening underway. 
Static scheduling is, for example, when the uh, administration put up the plan for uh, for teaching the facilities for rooms, classes, and, and teachers, for example, then they will know everything and everything will be more or less the same every week. Static scheduling is, for example, no, uh, dynamic scheduling, a thing happening uh, underway. A vehicle starts on a route which should be visit different customers and then they get a phone call that you should also deliver something at another customer which is outside of the original plan. So things is happening uh, all the time during the performance uh, period. So we have what we call here the hierarchy of the production process. You have the logical sequence of operations in the factory. You have, and this plan uh, planning will correspond to sequencing of the chapter in this book. Start with a forecast, forecast about the demand, and then the demand forecast are basis for the top level or the aggregate planning. The master production schedule will then be the result of the disaggregating the aggregate plan down to the individual item, what we just saw, which is also described in chapter 7. And based on the MPS, the MRP, used to determine the size and timing of component and sub-assembly production using uh, methods for lot sizing, for example. And now we will look at the last part here, which is the detailed shop floor schedules, which is required to meet the production plan resulting from the MRP. Now we are down to the, uh, the basic or the detailed floor level at the uh, production facility, for example, and need to define uh, or, or decide about the detailed plans, which is to be met. And this is also the hier hierarchy of the production decisions, which is also uh, well, shown by the, the sequence of the chapters in, in this textbook. And now we are here, last part, detailed job shop schedule to meet the specification of the production quantities from the MRP system. So let's now look at the particular job shop scheduling problem. And here we will talk about the job arrival pattern which, as we also talked about, is it static, is it dynamic? When do we know everything in advance so we can make a fixed plan which will be uh, met to, to all details? Or will things happen during the execution of, of this plan so we need to adjust it underway? Uh, one other characteristic, of course, number of variety of machines that can do, that could be several machines or several workers can do the same job. That is, of course, quite important when you decide about the job shop scheduling, who should do which jobs. Uh, number and skill level of workers, quite important, of course. They could be experts, could be, well, uh, pupils or apprentices, which is not very skilled, which takes more time, but still needs to, to learn the job to be skilled for, for later. Uh, the flow patterns also quite important that the material flow should uh, fit to the sequence of the job. So we need to make sure that you have the materials when you start executing the different jobs. And also the evaluation of the alternative rules. You might have different objectives or different priorities. What is most important in this particular case. And this is not uh, nothing you can say that the objective will always be to minimize the cost, for example, as we have seen in our models sometimes, or at this level, it's not necessarily the cost which is the most important, but it might be some, some other rules which you should use to, uh, to evaluate different plans. So here we have different objectives in this job shop scheduling. And what objective to use will depend on the actual problem. One is of course to meet the due date. This is well, always important. We should try to meet the due date. If a customer has a job or if you have a, 
uh, have an MRP uh, plan which we should, uh, we should meet the demand in one particular week. Uh, to meet the due dates is, uh, is quite important, but not always possible. It could be that you have several orders and you have different jobs that needs to be performed that have some kind of conflict that you are not able to meet the due dates for all the jobs. Uh, another objective could be to minimize the work in process inventory and uh, of course we, it's easy to think on the just-in-time strategy. Try to minimize the inventory during the, the, the work uh, process and uh, uh, produce everything exactly when you need it and order everything exactly when you need it. Uh, minimize the average flow time is another objective. Flow time is the time from a job is put into the system or planned or uh, from the time and a customer it will uh, require an, an order until it's finished. Uh, also maximize the utilization of a machine or a worker. Make sure that there are not much idle time. Reduce the setup times for changeovers could also be an objective when you are producing. A machine can usually be used to produce different types of products. And then to change the product you need to set up the machine in a different way which might be uh, costly and time consuming. So reduce the setup time is also one possible objective. And then minimize the direct production and labor cost could also be one objective. And of course these objectives can be conflicting. It's not always possible to meet all objective. If we prioritize to meet the due dates as good as, as possible, you might have to violate some of the other constraints. So let's also talk about the terminology before we look at examples. Uh, flow shop here defined as n a certain number of jobs to be processed through m machines in the same sequence. We will in our models in this course focus on the situation where m is equal to 1. We have only one machine or one worker or one work station. But the general problem is that you have several jobs and you also might have several machines or workstations that can do the same job or can do some of the jobs but not all and that might be in, in real world you have lots of, of different and more complex situations than you have in the simple models we will learn in, in the theory. But anyway you should know about these theories because then you can evaluate them and try to fit them into the real world problem when you get into a real job. Uh, the job shop is defined to be the sequencing of jobs through machines that might be different and there may be multiple operations on some of the machines. We talk about parallel versus sequential processing. Then parallel means that the machines are identical. You can in theory do the same jobs on different machines which also makes it a uh, problem to decide which machines to, uh, to define or, or, or to use for each of the jobs. The flow time of one particular job would be the time that, uh, which is elapsed from the initiation of the first job until it is completed. So when you have made a plan, you start the time or the counting of time and then the flow time of job number i will be the time from the plan is started until that particular job is finished. We talk about the make span, which is the flow time of the job which is completed last. And we also talk about the tardiness, which is the positive difference between the completion of time and the due date. Tardiness, also called delay. It might be positive. If you are delayed, if your job is finished after the due date, then you have tardiness. If the job is finished before or exactly at the due date, it has no tardiness. The tardiness is zero. And we also talk about the lateness, 
which is here defined to be the difference between the completion time and the due date, but this can also be negative, which means that if your job is finished one day before the due date, then it has a lateness of minus one, it is finished one day before, one day before, but the tardiness is zero. It is not delayed, the tardiness is zero. This is what this means. And what we are talking about as, uh, uh, well, one of the common uh, objective is to reduce the tardiness. The lateness is not that important because, well, we have a due date and we should finish before the due date. And if we are finished before, okay, but it's not usually not considered as, uh, um, as, a, as a measure of the effectiveness of the different um, of the, the different uh, sequences. And now I will just present shortly different sequencing rules which we should show. At least I will today show the first one here which is called the FCFS, first come, first served, which is the job processed in the order they come to the shop, which seems quite fair. First come, first serve, independent of the size of the job or the due date of the job. Another strategy is called the shortest processing time, which means that the job with the shortest processing time are scheduled first. We should finish all the small jobs first before we continue with the larger jobs. Uh, and then a third sequencing rule is the earliest due date. Jobs are sequenced according to the due dates. Look at the due date, the, the one job, uh, job that should be finished first is also executed first, independent of the size of the job. So here we have two different objectives and two different strategies. Shortest processing time will sequence according to the processing time. Earliest due date will sequence according to the due date. And we have some kind of combination here. The critical ratio will compute the ratio of the processing time of the job and remaining time until the due date and schedule the job with the largest critical ratio next, which is well, kind of combination between the SPT and the EDD. And then we have some, yeah. The rule that will minimize the mean flow time <coughs> is the shortest processing time. If this is the main objective, you should use this strategy. You also have the equivalent criteria here, the mean flow time, the mean waiting time, the mean lateness will actually mean the same. And we have two more methods, which we will also look into next time. The Morse algorithm is an algorithm to use when we want to minimize the number of tardy jobs, the number of delayed jobs. And sometimes you have a sequence where you have precedence, some jobs need to be performed for others, and then you can use this algorithm called Lawler's algorithm, which should be able to minimize the maximum flow time subject to the precedence constraint, according to which jobs needs to be finished before the others. So before we finish for today, I will uh, just shortly show about this first strategy, the first come, first serve strategy. And then we will continue uh, next week with, with the others and uh, also, as mentioned, I will also present the solution for, uh, for the assignment uh, uh, next week, at least hopefully. But now let's first look at the first come, first serve and let's now assume that we have five different jobs and we will look at these jobs, solving them according to all the different strategies. One, two, three, four, and five. Each of them will have a processing time and each of them will have a due date, which can be given in days or hours or any time. Uh, yeah, you, what time you actually want. Uh, process time, means that job number one will here use 11 days, job two, 29, job three, 31, 
job 4, 1, and job 5, 2. This makes a total make span of the sum of these numbers, five numbers, total of 74. Which means that independent of sequence, when you have only one machine to sequence these jobs, you will use 74 days. Whatever sequence you use, the number of days will be constant, the same. Due date is here, 61. For job number one, it should be finished before day 61. 45 for job two, 31, job three, 33, job four, and 32, job five. And what we now immediately can see that this is not possible to finish, in a, uh, to find a feasible sequence where all jobs are finished, finished within time. Because the make span, the total number of days used to execute these five jobs is 74. And the due date is lower than 74 for all these jobs. So at least one job need to be late. Okay, let's use the FCFS strategy. First come, first served, which means that we first execute job one, then two, three, four, and five. Completion time, also called the flow time, because we remember the flow time is the time from we start the first job in the sequence until one particular job is finished. Completion time or flow time here will be 11 for job number one. It takes 11 days. Job number two will take 29 more days, be finished by day 40. Job number three, 31 more days, 71. Job number four will only take one day, finished by day 72. And job number five, two days, finished by day 74, like we see here. Last job will be finished by day 74, independent of sequence. And if we now look at the tardiness, we can see that job number one is finished very early. Day 11 has a due date of 61. So this is not tardy, this is not delayed. Job number two, finished by day 40, has a due date of 45. This is also in time. Job three, due date of 31, finished on 71, 40 days late. Job number four, due date 33, finished 72, 39 days late. And the job number five finished on day 74 and has a due date of 32, 42 days late. So we can now try to define different objectives according to this strategy. One is to find the mean flow time. Mean flow time will be the average of the values here, the average of the flow time or the completion time. Uh, if you sum this, you will get 268. And then the mean flow time is 268 divided by five. Flow time. 268 divided by 5 should be 53.6. We can also talk about the average tardiness. Average, usually use mean there and average there for some reason. The mean are exactly the same, mean and average. And the mean or average tardiness will then be this is 121, the sum of these three, divided by the number of jobs. Which will be 24.2. We have another measure which, uh, which is called the number of tardy jobs.
which is in, in this case is three. Three jobs are delayed. And we can also look at the maximum tardiness, the maximum delay. Maximum tardiness, which is also quite easy to see here. 42. 42 is the maximum delay for one job in this sequence. So now we have values for four different measures which can be used to compare with other strategies. Because this, as mentioned, this is uh, considered as a fair strategy to the customers, first come, first served. But of course, this is not the most effective strategy according to other objectives. Uh, you have a very high delay here. Here you have a very critical job. It should be finished, it should be sequenced first to make sure that this is finished in time. If this job is most important, it should be first for before job number one and two, and so on. So you have different sequencing strategies according to the different measures or the different objectives shown here. And then, of course, it's the, well, the decision to decide what is the most important objective and then choose a sequencing method which will minimize that particular objective. We will come back to that uh, later, as mentioned. Next week, I will uh, present the solution for assignment number three and then continue on this uh, scheduling which part, which is the last part of the curriculum.